Good morning, welcome, and thank you for joining us here today. I hope you're all safe, and I hope you're all well. To first introduce myself, my name is Camilla Campion Awad, and I lead on investor relations and institutional fund related matters for both Private Equity Europe and Private Equity Technology. I'm delighted to participate in this webinar titled The Japanese Economy Today, Winds of Change or Winds of Stagflation with our guest speaker, Professor Haizu Takanaka. Nearly three decades after its asset bubble burst back in 1991, Japan is still characterized by many as being economically stagnant. The reality is, however, far more nuanced for Japan, the world's third largest economy. Professor Takanaka is Professor Emeritus at Kyo University and a professor at Toyo University. He has taken several positions within the Japanese government, including Minister for Financial Services and Economic and Fiscal Policy, and the Minister for Internal Affairs and Communications. During his time in government, he realized the privatization of Japan Post, the biggest public enterprise in Japan. As well as being the author of numerous books, Professor Takanaka sits on a number of boards and committees, including InvestCorp's own advisory board. This morning, the professor will be in conversation with Jeremy Ghosh, Global Head of InvestCorp Credit Management. Jeremy is, of course, no stranger to Japan and has enjoyed long-standing ties with this incredible country beginning with his leadership at Mizuho Corporate Bank. Jeremy was founder of Mizuho's leverage finance business in 1998 and founder of their independent fund management business in 2005. He was the first non-Japanese member of Mizuho's board and has traveled back and forth regularly to Japan for over 35 years. But, before we begin the discussion, we will gain some insights from our co-CEO, Rishi Kapoor. Having joined InvestCorp from Citigroup in 1992, Rishi oversees our private equity businesses in North America and India, as well as the real estate, credit management, absolute returns, and strategic capital divisions globally. In 2019, Rishi was recognized by Forbes Middle East as one of the top 10 Indian executives making an impact in the region. So thank you. I'm sure you all, like me, look forward to learning more about this fascinating topic. Rishi, over to you. Thank you, Camilla. Uh, and good afternoon to, to all of you. Uh, I do hope everyone is uh, keeping safe and, uh, and as well. It's an absolute pleasure uh, to be talking to you all uh, virtually today. Um, we do, uh, Jeremy and I were reminiscing uh, a couple of weeks ago, we do miss our opportunities to come down to Tokyo once in a while and uh, be together with you in person. And fingers crossed, you know, that day will come uh, again soon. Uh, but for today, we'll try and uh, work with the technology that we have available to us. I'm just going to take a couple of minutes, uh, no more than four or five minutes, uh, to give you a brief idea of what InvestCorp is. If you think about InvestCorp, think of us as a global mid-market focused alternatives manager that has been around for 40 years very dedicated and very committed to our core competence around the mid-market and absolutely committed to our corporate purpose, which is to enrich the lives of future generations. We have been global since day one, not just in our reach and our footprint, 
but also in our outlook. If you look at the footprint of InvestCorp today, it's about 450 people spread out over 12 offices spanning all three major continents, North America, Europe, as well as Asia. In North America, we have offices, our biggest office in fact, uh, globally is in New York. In Europe, we are present in both Luxembourg as well as in London, of course, in the Middle East. And then uh, more recently, we have established uh, quite a sizable toehold in Asia, in India, in Singapore, and in recently in Beijing, China, and hopefully soon to be added uh, Tokyo. Um, that group of 450 people represents uh, 44 nationalities. And you immediately get a sense for the diversity that InvestCorp brings to the table. That's what I meant earlier. We are a global firm looking to bring a truly local flavor and be close to our investors. That is our main uh, constituency. Um, we manage just a little over $33 billion in aggregate assets today on behalf of our clients across four major alternative asset classes. Private equity, where we have been investing in mid-market businesses all the way back to 1982. We have invested in over 200, and 200 companies over this period of time, deployed more than $44 billion of capital. There are 63 companies that we own in our portfolio today. And our focus since the beginning within the mid-market has been on leverage buyouts, growth capital, Recently, we've added a capability around strategic capital as well as infrastructure. And within the overall industry landscape, our uh, focus sectors lately in particular have been around tech-enabled businesses, understandably, uh, and business services. The second uh, business that we are present in, and we have been present in almost all the way back to our very beginnings, uh, back to 1982, is real estate. And within real estate, uh, today we are active in the US, in Europe, and in India. We invest predominantly in income generating properties with high levels of occupancy where a big focus of the return is, is on cash yield. Um, in the US in particular, we have consistently been amongst the top five cross-border foreign investors in US real estate over the last 10 years or so. So, which is a very, very uh, important, significant uh, brand for us. Um, our third business is, is our hedge funds related business. We call it Absolute Returns, where we invest in single hedge funds, as well as multi-manager solutions, both on a customized basis, as well as in a commingled format. And then cycling forward, our fourth business, which in AUM terms is also our largest business with close to $14 billion of total assets under management is the credit management business um, that uh, Jeremy uh, oversees. That credit management business today is largely focused on investing into the loans of large cap companies, around 600 companies on a transatlantic basis between US and Europe. Uh, globally, we are amongst the top 25 uh, CLO managers. In Europe, we are easily amongst the top 10. And Japan in particular has been a very important domain uh, for our credit management business right from the outset. It has consistently represented between 12 to 15% of our total AUM, but more importantly, Japanese institutions have uh, blue chip names amongst the Japanese institutional landscape, have been consistent investors in our CLOs, in the AAA tranches in particular, which is evidence of the, the position, the regard that we uh, have the fortune of being beneficiaries of uh, in the market uh, in Japan. So with that uh, brief introduction uh, to InvestCorp, let me not be the, the guy that stands between you and the interesting insights. We are all looking forward to hearing from uh, Takenaka-san and hand it over to, to Jeremy uh, and the ensuing uh, conversation he will have with Takenaka-san. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rishi. <clears throat> um, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all and welcome uh, to our webinar. Um, 
Professor Takenaka, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be able to uh, have this opportunity to be able to speak with you today. So let's uh, kick off uh, the dialogue. Um, we've seen a spike in infection uh, cases in Japan recently. How do you think uh, the government led by uh, Prime Minister Suga is coping with uh, COVID-19? And when do you really think that uh, Japan is going to be able to get out uh, of this tunnel? Well, thank you very much, Jeremy, for raising a very uh, important question at the beginning of this webinar. Uh, but anyway, I'd like to say thank you very much uh, to all the people whose effort uh, made this webinar possible. Well, COVID-19, uh, this is a very uh, serious issue uh, also in Japan. However, generally speaking, uh, maybe you understand that not only in Japan, but also in most Asian countries, the death ratio to the total population is extremely low compared with the United States and some European countries. Uh, death ratio in Japan uh, is about maybe 3% of that of the United States. A U.S. death rate ratio is uh, about 33 or 35 times, 35 times of that of Japan. So under such circumstances, of course, the number of infected is increasing. And so uh, based upon that reality, uh, Prime Minister Suga uh, is part of the declaration of emergency at the beginning of this month. But a more important issue for Japan is not infection itself, but the, how to provide the uh, medical services. Well, we have a huge, a rich, very rich medical resources. However, at this moment, only 3% of the total hospital beds are allocated for COVID-19 uh, infected. So now the government is improving this kind of situation. So uh, this is an important process to fight against COVID-19 crisis. Under that uh, situation, I believe uh, gradually the people, the sentiment, people's concern on the worry on the COVID-19 will decline. But still, since even from the viewpoint of the medical uh, specialist, uh, COVID-19, the uh, coronavirus is a very unknown virus. So we cannot expect exactly when uh, we can uh, conquer this kind of situation. But anyway, uh, toward uh, the, the, the vaccination, uh, vaccination will start uh, maybe at the end of next month. Uh, so I believe towards the springtime, uh, the station will be calmed down and also economic activity will come back gradually along with that. This is my observation. <clears throat> it's uh, quite incredible, uh, Takenaka-san, and it's uh, Japan is uh, awe. Everybody is in awe of Japan given uh, the aging uh, population, given the density of the population, uh, however, uh, Japan has managed uh, very successfully, you know, to keep uh, the spread of this uh, disease uh, at a very low level. And even more incredible, it seems, is your mortality rate that has been uh, so low. Uh, let me move on to the uh, economy of Japan. Um, it's a highly developed free market economy. Uh, it's the third largest in the world by nominal GDP. Uh, the fourth largest uh, by purchasing power parity, and of course, uh, the second largest in the developed economies. How did this pandemic affect the Japanese economic uh, growth prospects? And uh, how are you seeing the forecast for uh, 2021 and beyond? Well, thank you very much, Jeremy, again. It is uh, also quite important uh, the how to improve the current situation of the economy. Well, uh, COVID-19 crisis, uh, because of COVID, well, this, uh, the economy was very negatively uh, impacted, affected. For example, uh, very, let me raise a very symbolic figure. In the second quarter of last year, from April to June, the GDP growth rate GDP growth rate was minus 29%, minus 29%. At that time, US growth rate, American growth rate was also minus 30% or so. So we are in a, in a very similar way uh, affected in a negative way. And also the economy is now recovering. 
at, the, uh, at this moment, according to the formal statement of the cabinet office of the government. The economy is slowly but steadily recovering. Uh, but the situation, the, the absolute level of uh, economic activity is still not high enough. So we need more improvement. And under the COVID-19 uh, declaration of emergency, the, the economy, I, I'm afraid, will show uh, again the negative growth in the first quarter of this year. Uh, however, in the case of Japan, we can see some interesting phenomena. One is, well, the rate of unemployment is still very low. Well, yes. in the second quarter last year, uh, rate of unemployment increased a little bit, but only from 0.5% point, from 25 to 3%. At that time, in the United States, the rate of un unemployment increased from 4% to 14%. Of course, it had been improved a little bit. Uh, however, uh, based upon the well, Japanese are uh, very unique uh, labor market system. And also uh, Japanese uh, government uh, provided some grant to keep employment uh, to the businesses. So across the country, the rate of unemployment didn't increase. At this moment, the current rate of unemployment is only 2.8%. So this is one phenomenon, important phenomenon. Another one is uh, the number of bankruptcy is still very low. Amazingly low. Well, uh, the bankruptcy cases rather decreased compared with uh, uh, the previous year. Uh, on, the, on, on the background of this, however, the uh, business closing is now increasing, not bankruptcy, but they intentionally close their businesses. So uh, in this, this is indicating, of, of course, the economic situation is very uh, serious. So we cannot be so optimistic about that. So based upon that, while the government, Suga government provided the third round, third round of supplementary budget about a month ago, uh, this amount is huge, uh, 20 trillion yen uh, of uh, uh, in the substantial base. Well, at that time we had 34 trillion yen of uh, GDP gap and the government expenditure will, uh, will, will recover more than a half of this uh, a GDP gap. In that sense, uh, Mr. Suga's uh, macroeconomic management is really good. And also at that time, he created a green fund uh, <clears throat> to realize the 2050 uh, carbon neutral. And also he established the digital fund for the digital transformation of the country. So in that sense, economic, uh, Japanese economic policy is moving toward the better direction. And according to the estimate the, of the uh, cabinet office, the growth rate of 2021 fiscal year of the Japanese economy will be 4.0%. 4, 4 and even the private institution think tanks are expecting growth rate will be 3.5%, not so low. Uh, so uh, they are relatively optimistic. I am not very pessimistic, but I'm not so pessimistic. I'm a, uh, so we need some cautious optimism if needed. Right. But anyway, the Japanese economy is uh, showing some uh, steady recovery at this moment. <clears throat> that is very insightful indeed. Uh, we are also have been watching uh, Japan's drive into ESG, uh, which is of course a very uh, thematic uh, globally. Um, moving on. Uh, the financial profile of global uh, capital cities are clearly changing. Uh, we can see that with, uh, with Hong Kong. Um, clearly we can uh, see that with London now that Brexit has happened. Um, how does the Japanese government plan to strengthen Tokyo's position as a financial hub for Asia? Um, what kind of policy changes uh, would you propose to uh, uh, Suga-san's government uh, today? Well, again, Jeremy, your point, uh, well, Hong Kong situation is changing uh, dramatically. Hong Kong and Singapore have been playing a very important role as a financial hub in Asia. Of course, right. Tokyo has a huge 
uh, scale of the financial market. We have huge amount of asset. So we have a st strong potential. Tokyo has a very strong potential to become another financial hub in the Asia. Uh, well, I, uh, Mori, this is a very unique research foundation, Mori Memorial Foundation. Uh, I am a head of that foundation. And this foundation had been uh, in publishing the global power city ranking, power city ranking. The first place is uh, the London, the second place New York, third place Tokyo, and fourth place Paris, fifth place Singapore. And also uh, Tokyo had a very strong economic power uh, and also cultural power at the same time. Uh, however, regarding the uh, function of the uh, financial hub, in the case of Japan, as you know, tax rate is high compared yes. with Hong Kong and Singapore. This is honestly one important obstacle. Or still, the government is planning to reduce the rate of inheritance tax, not income right. tax at this moment, inheritance tax. So government is so government will understand this uh, defect and moving to, towards uh, improving the situation. And also regarding the function of financial hub, well, there could be several functions. Well, in the case of Japan or Tokyo, maybe we have a very strong potential, the asset management, asset management. And the financial yes. service agency is focusing, is going to focus this function. Uh, as for the foreign exchange trade, et cetera, et cetera, well, Singapore has the strengths. Uh, but uh, asset management, uh, well, we, Tokyo will have a strength, strength, uh, strength uh, strong point. And uh, financial service agency decided to accept uh, all, you know, uh, document, all document in English. And uh, the, uh, the financial service agencies, uh, the people, who is in charge of asset management is supposed to discuss everything in English, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And combining this effort, well, uh, Tokyo still have a very strong uh, uh, potential to become the financial hub in Asia. And also, Tokyo Metropolitan Governor Ms. Koike is very yes. eager to realize that. And so, well, we are moving in the right direction. But still, though we have. Uh, uh, one uh, shortage, a uh, high tax rate. But anyway, I really expect that government will take more uh, drastic action uh, regarding the tax policy. Uh, absolutely. And um, uh, we are seeing uh, more and more uh, discussion going on, Takinaka san, with uh, my peers, other uh, fund managers, and management companies uh, regarding uh, setting up. Uh, in Tokyo, uh, Japan, as um, uh, Rishi mentioned earlier, you know we have a tour hall uh, in Singapore uh, and in Mumbai, and uh, we are uh, actively uh, considering uh, doing the same uh, um, to be in Tokyo and Japan uh, in the foreseeable future. Um, let me move on to another interesting topic. This is. Uh, been around from uh, from since when I started uh, visiting Japan, which, as Camilla mentioned, uh, 35 uh, years ago, um, is the uh, perennial question of aging uh, population. And uh, as you know well, uh, Japan has been very strict uh, with immigration, uh, one of the strictest countries over the last uh, 10, 20 years. Um, and if you look at the demographics, and the profile and the forecasts, Takenaga-san, you know uh, better than anybody else, um, they look uh, at a shrinking uh, population. And more importantly, um, aging as a percentage of population uh, is getting higher and higher. Um, how is the government planning to deal uh, with this um, issue that has been around for so long? Uh, any new plans under PM Suga-san? Well, demographic trend is a, a very serious problem for Japan. The total population of Japan already started declining uh, about 10 years ago or so. And, uh, uh, and the working age population uh, declining pace is much faster than that. And so uh, the Japanese industries, companies have been suffering from labor shortage for the past several years. 
under such circumstances, Abe government, former government, decided yes. to accept some foreign labor. And this is the advancing, of course. At this moment, because of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, this process is stopped. However, uh, beyond that, maybe uh, Japanese uh, government, especially the Suga government, will uh, be relatively eager to accept the foreign labor. Uh, this is uh, quite true. At the same time, uh, now, the labor participation ratio for women, labor participation ratio for senior people, this has been increasing a lot. As a result of that, uh, while total population is declining, but working population increased uh, in the past several years. Uh, and also amazingly, uh, regarding the labor participation ratio for women, for female, the, the ratio in Japan is higher than that of the United States already. So this is one uh, important fact, but of course, the still total population is declining. So we need to accept the foreign labor. Uh, I understand that Mr. Suga, Prime Minister Suga is very uh, eager to accept the foreign labor. He will understand the very current situation of the labor market. And at the same time, it is very important for the government to, to make reform, to reform the total structure of the labor market. This is very important. Of course, we have to accept foreign labor. At the same time, we have to create much more flexible labor market. The combining this effort will help to some extent uh, to the problem, the shortage of labor. Uh, but still, uh, as you mentioned, Jeremy, uh, the, the, the change of the demography uh, remains to be a very uh, difficult task for the government, for the society. Absolutely. And uh, thank you for those um... Uh, very, very comprehensive uh, angles and answers uh, that uh, you're kindly providing us, Takenaka-san. Moving on to uh, relationships, uh, Japan uh, and US uh, first, and then we'll uh, no doubt talk about Japan and China, two of the biggest uh, trading uh, relationships that uh, Japan has. Uh, clearly very timely, uh, President Biden just took over uh, literally uh, uh, a couple of days ago. Um, and um, how do you see the relationship uh, between uh, Biden uh, and Suga uh, developing? Um, and I think uh, also, uh, how do you see, um, do you see any policy changes, uh, economic or otherwise, uh, in relationships between Japan and US, which has been uh, I would say one of the strongest relationships since the uh, Second World War. Well, I do not think that there will be any change the relationship between the United States and Japan. For Japan, the United States is absolutely the most important country, economically and uh, politically and military also. Uh, our security is, you know, how we are, you know, provided uh, uh, the United States providing the security umbrella to, to Japan. We live very safely under the umbrella of the United States. So our Japanese government is, of course, is ready to pay more uh, for this cost. Uh, but still, the, the relationship with the United States is very important. The US is an important ally, allied country. And so, uh, well, honestly, Japan has been uh, enjoying the biggest benefit from the so-called so so liberal world order since the uh, end of the Second World War. The liberal world order uh, means uh, free trade, uh, multilateralism, and globalization, etc. We received a lot of benefit from this. And the rule maker of this liberal world order was the United States. Very regrettably, in the past several years, this role as a rule maker of, uh, of our liberal order uh, was abandoned by the President Trump. But to some extent, this kind of uh, function will come back to the United States. I expect, expect that. Japan cannot be a rule maker. We understand that. But Japan will be and should be the rule shaper rule shaper of the liberal world order. So after the Mr. Trump 
uh, left the uh, TPP agreement, then our uh, former Prime Minister Abe uh, concluded the so-called TPP-11. Uh, and we are now waiting uh, for the United States coming back to TPP agreement. And also Japan concluded the free trade agreement with EU at that time. Yes. So this covers 30% of the total GDP in the world. And this covered on 40% of the total trade uh, in the world. And also for the China, this is another important country. This is a neighboring country and the yeah. largest uh, import and exporter for us, uh, you mentioned. And so, uh, well, uh, Mr. Suga is a very pragmatic person in a sense. Of uh, course, so the basically US is the most important country. At the same time, he's watching very carefully uh, this trade relationship with uh, uh, China. Uh, but, but so Mr. Suga is going to have a very good balance between the United States and Japan. Uh, so this is the basic stance of some kind of, so in that sense, some kind of strategic ambiguity, strategic ambiguity is needed. US is important, at the same time China is important. Uh, so we are watching very carefully what will happen, the relations between the United States and China. <clears throat> Thank you for that, uh, Takenaga san. And moving forward, um, clearly another uh, a big point that um, uh, we have seen uh, being raised over and over again uh, is the uh, topic of deflation uh, uh, in, in Japan. Uh, you have now seen a whole generation uh, growing up, um, uh, not used to making the big investments, used to the whole deflationary uh, environment. So that's uh, one topic I'd uh, like to hear your thoughts on. Um, and uh, <clears throat> secondly, Japan uh, probably enjoys the world's most uh, equitable income uh, distribution, but equality of uh, that doesn't uh, uh, really mean equality of opportunity. So how uh, will it provide more rainbows to chase for those who wish to put their talents to work. And uh, do you see a change, Takenaka-san, in terms of uh, more entrepreneurs uh, uh, like Son-san emerge uh, in, in the, in the uh, uh, Japanese society? Well, first of all, deflation. Uh, well, uh, this deflation started mid 90s after the burst of the bubble. Since then, uh, the Japanese economy had been suffering from this very persistent deflation for more than 20, uh, nearly 20 years. Uh, but at the beginning of the Abe administration, new governor of Bank of Japan was uh, nominated, Mr. Kuroda, and he had very uh, bold monetary expansion. As a result of that, uh, CPI, a growth rate, increasing rate, consumer price index increasing rate is not negative. Now it is positive. Inflation targeting, target is a 2% positive, but still the reality is far from the target, but this is not a negative. So to some extent, this anti-deflation policy is uh, working well. Uh, this is the first point. Of course, the choice of the central bank is not very difficult. I'm very much sympathized with uh, Mr. Kuroda, Governor Kuroda, but uh, may maybe he will uh, uh, continue the current policy. And you pointed the uh, income distribution and uh, yeah. equality as a result, but equality in opportunity is much more important. I completely agree with you. Well, still in the field of politics, so-called vested interest group people are strong, has a strong power politically. And some politicians are supporting that and some bureaucrats are support, support, uh, you know, supporting that. This is called the Iron Triangle, vested interest group and uh, some politicians and some bureaucrats. The Iron, tri tri Iron Triangle is still persistently existing in the Japanese politics. So, so uh, Mr. Suga is a very right person to break this kind of uh, Iron Triangle. At the very beginning, when he, in, uh, he took office, he very clearly uh, insisted this government will realize the deregulation, 
the, the deregulation means the uh, well government will provide any various kind of opportunity to newcomer, newcomer. Uh, so uh, I am now a member of the policy board named the Growth Strategy Council. Uh, in this council, we are very seriously discussing what kind of deregulation is needed. Of course, finally, a political power is needed uh, since uh, vested interest group people have a very still strong political power. Uh, in that sense, the supporting ratio to Mr. Suga, supporting ratio of the public to the cabinet is very important. Regrettably, it's a little bit declining. However, the situation is not so unstable because the supporting ratio to the ruling party is still very high and supporting ratio to the opposition party remains very low. So under such circumstances, I believe Prime Minister Suga will pursue deregulation, providing a huge opportunity to the newcomers. Uh, so this is a very basic stance of the uh, current Suga government. And uh, <clears throat> Takenaka-san, just continuing on that theme, is there anything more specific uh, being done for the younger uh, generation? Um, and also uh, clearly the, the falling birth rate uh, is of course a big uh, concern, not least the aging population that uh, you had touched upon earlier. Is there anything specific being done uh, to focus on those two, uh, uh, those two critical areas? Well, honestly, this is a very difficult uh, issue. How to support, uh, you know, uh, younger generations? Well, still Japanese businesses have uh, so-called lifetime employment seniority-based pay system. Some major companies still have seniority-based pay system. So compared with the senior gen generations, younger people's uh, life is uh, uh, not so sat satisfactory. So uh, while well, Prime Minister and uh, of course he is very much concerned about that, uh, but, but anyway, uh, one, one Theoretical answer will be uh, the government will provide basic income system, basic income system. I am personally proposing that. Uh, however, this is not easy to realize, to be realized politically. But in the, but in the future, at least, this kind of idea, uh, basic income system, to provide at least at the, at the, the bottom line of the, uh, the standard of living is provided by the government. This kind of policy will be discussed sooner or later, I believe personally. And also uh, providing the various kind of uh, business opportunity to young people, but the government is providing special economic zone system, special economic zone system. As I mentioned, uh, deregulation is not so easy politically. However, in this designated area, deregulation uh, can be done in an advanced manner. Uh, we have al already designated some special economic zone in Japan. Tokyo is included, Osaka is included. And so, well, uh, making use of this kind of uh, uh, deregulation tool, tool uh, uh, is also very beneficial, if, especially for young business people. I'm also expecting that young business and the very ambitious businessmen uh, will make use of this kind of scheme, a special economic zone, uh, for, for, uh, to promote the deregulation. Takenaka san, uh, uh, lastly, from my side, I'm sure you will have uh, uh, some uh, questions for me uh, to answer. But lastly, from my side, uh, what is uh, your uh, global economic outlook? Uh, given that, uh, you know, we have just come through one of the most difficult uh, years uh, known uh, to mankind, and uh, we are no, by no means out of the woods yet. Uh, how do you see uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the global outlook from where you're sitting? Well, just a year ago, uh, around the end of January last year, uh, we had this kind of discussion in Davos meeting. At that time, the leaders of the uh, major countries, uh, major countries, and the leaders of international organizations have shown very, have showed very optimistic view. The year 2020 economy will be really good. 
based upon the policy effort, et cetera, et cetera. However, I just said not realized. So at that, in that sense, we cannot be so optimistic about that. According to the estimate of IMF, as you know, uh, the growth rate of uh, 2020, the world growth rate was minus 4%. And the 2021 will be positive 5%. So economy will come back. Of course, it depends on the uh, vaccination process, how effective this vaccination will, will be. Uh, this is a very important factor, but still, so we cannot say something concrete on that point, uh, but a positive 5% growth of the world economy. This would be too optimistic, I'm afraid. So, well, maybe the world economy will show positive growth. However, the growth rate will be not high enough. Uh, they still, the level of economic activity is uh, lower than the previous year, 2019. Uh, so we should not be, we, we, we cannot be very pessimistic, but as I mentioned, some cautious optimism, uh, maybe the world growth rate will be uh, two, 3% level and also well, China under the state capitalism, uh, China's growth rate will be uh, very high compared with other uh, capitalist countries. Uh, this is a very rough uh, sketch of the uh, global economy this year. <clears throat> That's very, very good to hear and very encouraging, uh, Takenaka-san, at least uh, a, a more positive uh, global outlook uh, is being forecast, I think, uh, uh, by the street uh, as well, given uh, we are seeing the uh, rollout of vaccinations and so on. Uh, my sense is it's more likely to uh, gather pace from second half of 2021 and beyond, uh, not least because of the pent up demand uh, also uh, uh, in, the, in the various economies. Oh, may I raise one question, Jeremy, to you? Please go ahead. <laughs> uh, this is about the uh, Biden administration of the United States. Uh, you have been looking at uh, the situation of the United States and other countries, uh, very frankly, where there could be two uh, opinions, very optimistic one, very pessimistic one. The pessimistic one is, uh, well, he's now 78 years old. Four years from now, his age will be 82. So second term uh, presidency will, will, will be impossible. So he, have, he has only four years. However, in the last half of four years, will, he will suffer from so-called lame deck. So he has, he will have only two years, but still uh, some uh, the, 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 the management on the Congress will be not so easy. Uh, so under such circumstances, the uh, Biden government will become very weak government. Also, he's, uh, he's uh, uh, in the case of uh, President Trump, he was, uh, he was in a sense very amateur, amateur president. So from time to time, he surprised the China. Uh, but Mr. Biden is a very orthodox politician. He's an insider of Washington, DC. Uh, so Chinese leaders, most of them study, used to study in the United States now, and he, they will understand the Washington manner. Under such circumstances, uh, China will have uh, some, uh, well, attack to, to the United States ad by, by the administration in many ways. So this is a very pessimistic one. Another one is, no, 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 Biden will become a very tough negotiator from the viewpoint of China, uh, because he, in the case of Trump, uh, Trump paid more attention on, on economy or money, money. So solution could be found in money transaction. However, in the case of uh, Mr. Biden, he's a real politician and uh, diplomat. So he'll become a rather tough negotiator for the United States. Well, this, this is a, this kind of our idea we sometimes hear. I'd like to hear uh, your opinion, Jeremy. Sure. Um, uh, Takenaga-san, I, I, I'm uh, uh, more on the uh, optimistic side, um, simply because I think if you look at uh, past uh, democratic uh, governments, and not least um, Biden and uh, uh, Janet Yellen has already 
uh, talked about a very, very substantial stimulus uh, package. Mm. Um, clearly, they're going to face a continuing opposition uh, from the Republicans. But um, I, I, I see uh, much more stimulus uh, uh, coming through. Clearly, there will be some impact on um, taxation uh, likely to go up. Uh, but for uh, overall uh, economy and also uh, geopolitical wise, I see a much more neutral stance um, by the US uh, administration. So as we all know, um, President Trump was uh, very confrontational. Uh, I do not see that happening uh, with Biden. I think it will be more accommodation. Um, it will be more calming down the rhetoric, uh, you know, with China. But uh, I still think that they will continue to pursue a hard stance uh, with China, uh, but in a more manageable or amicable uh, way. So uh, given the uh, uh, history of democratic governments, um, given the big stimulus package uh, that we already expect, uh, even though it might not end up being as big as they want it to be, um, all of that is likely to be uh, on more on the positive uh, than on the negative side. And, um, and again, I think from the perception uh, of the world that we live in, Pakinagasan, which is the world of credit, um, uh, credit markets uh, continue to perform well and uh, stable uh, performance when there is excess of uh, stimulus package, as we have really enjoyed for the last 10 years, frankly, uh, ever since the start of the a global financial crisis. So uh, answering your question, uh, you know, uh, in, 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 uh, in a uh, summarized way, I'm more uh, on the uh, optimistic side uh, going forward. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you very much. Very persuasive, yes. <clears throat> um, Fakin uh, I think uh, we are uh, running short on time and um, I wanted to... Uh, ask you a very uh, few quick questions before we end off. Um, the, uh, what's your uh, thinking on the prospects of the uh, uh, Olympics uh, going ahead? Well, Prime Minister Suga is very eager to host Olympic, uh, to realize Olympic, Paralympic game, of course. And uh, well, uh, this final decision were not made, not by the Japanese government, this will, should be made by International Olympic Committee, IOC. Uh, from the viewpoint of IOC, uh, maybe they need the uh, you know, payment from the American TV companies. So uh, the bottom line will be, well, to host the Olympic Paralympic game, even without audience. So it's, if so, this is televised. So the JOC, Japan, Japan Olympic Committee, Japan Olympic Committee is uh, uh, considering various type of Olympics with full audience and only domestic audience and the no audience, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, but still, the Japanese government is very eager to host the Olympic Paralympic game. And in Japan, domestically, uh, so-called uh, uh, what to say uh, the uh, how how do you say in English? Seika Seika Rire, how to say Kim. How do you say, say <clears throat> Taking the flag, you mean? And uh, oh, flag, the, the fire, the, 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 the torch. The, the, the chariot. Torch. The chariot. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes, this will start the end of, uh, the end of March. The end right. of March. Uh, so before that, the, everything will be decided. Uh, so we have to wait for more two months or so but uh, uh, before that, I really expect that the current declaration of emergency will be halted. Uh, well, but maybe so. And in about a month, the vaccination will start. Uh, so this, this is a, a basic scenario by the Japanese government. I believe so. Takenaga-san, uh, I would like to thank you very much uh, for your very frank and transparent comments, uh, very insightful. Uh, indeed, 
Uh, I learned a lot uh, today uh, and I hope uh, our participants and audience uh, were able uh, to uh, also uh, enjoy and learn. Um, I would like to end um, this webinar uh, by saying um, stay safe uh, to uh, all our uh, investors and colleagues and uh, a very happy new year again to each and every one of you. And as Rishi mentioned at the beginning, uh, really hoping to see you all in person uh, in Tokyo or anywhere uh, in the world. Uh, thank you again, Takenaka-san, and I wish you well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for a nice arrangement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.